You will hear a number of different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. Now look at section one. Section one. You will hear a man talking to a woman on the phone about booking a room for an event. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Silverton Hall event booking. Jenny speaking. How can I help you? Oh, hi. Um, I'd like to book the hall for an event that I'm planning to hold. What date did you have in mind? Well, I was hoping for the fifteenth of January. The man wants to make the booking for the fifteenth of January, so fifteenth January has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Silverton Hall event booking. Jenny speaking. How can I help you? Oh hi. Um, I'd like to book the hall for an event that I'm planning to hold. What date did you have in mind? Well, I was hoping for the fifteenth of January. Let me just check. That's a Friday, isn't it? No, it's a Saturday. Ah, oh, just a minute. I'm looking at last year's calendar. Yes, you're right. We have something on in the afternoon, I'm afraid, but the evening is free. Great! I was hoping to have it in the evening. Okay. And what times were you thinking of? Well, the event is from eight p.m. until eleven p.m., but I suppose we'll need to book it a bit earlier to set everything up, and a bit later to clear up at the end. Yes, you will. So shall we say seven thirty to eleven thirty? Would that be okay? Yes, that'll be fine. So, what kind of event is it? Well, I'm organising a concert. Some of my friends and I play musical instruments, so we're hoping to get together, and we're inviting all of our friends to come along. Oh, that sounds like fun. What do you play? The guitar. And my friend Jack plays several instruments. Great. So, how many guests are you planning on? Well, I'm not sure, but probably about sixty. That's fine. Thanks. Can I just mention that some of them are disabled? I assume that'll be all right, and that access won't be a problem. Of course. We have special facilities, and we've made some improvements recently as well. Great. Um. So, what about food? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, I thought we'd have something simple. I don't want anything complicated, like a buffet or a three-course meal. So just sandwiches, really, and also something to drink, if that's okay. I've got that. So, if you're playing music, do you have your own equipment? Because if not, we can provide that for you. Yes, we have our own equipment. We have our own instruments and microphones and amplifiers. We have everything except for a piano, which would be very useful. Would it be possible for you to provide one? Yes, of course. I'll make a note of that. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions seven to ten.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 7 to 10. Now, I don't know if you're aware, but parking has become a bit of a problem around the hall. Well, actually, it's a problem all over the centre of town. And so we do offer some transport solutions. Oh, well, we were planning on driving to the hall. Um, uh, I wouldn't recommend that. We do have a coach that will pick everyone up and take them home at the end of the evening. It costs a bit extra, but does work out cheaper than taking taxis. Would you be interested in that? Hmm. Yes, please. And I guess that would be easier than trying to park all our cars. It certainly would. Now, I think I have all the details. Let me just add up the costs. Hmm. That comes to £250. But I'll reduce it to £225, as we have a 10% discount from now until March. Well, that's great. Thank you so much. And now I just need a contact name. I guess that would be you, right? Yes, that's right. It's Rob. OK. And your family name? It's Yasovsky. I'll spell that for you. It's J... E Z O W S K I. Thanks. And do you have a contact number? Oh, yes. Hang on a minute. I haven't memorized it yet. <laughs> yes, here it is. It's O seven two three two eight double five four nine six. Great. I think that's everything for now. I look forward to seeing you on the 15th of January. OK, thanks. Bye for now. That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now look at Section 2. Section 2. You will hear a manager talking to new employees at a coffee processing factory. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Welcome to Coffee Incorporated, where you'll be starting work next week. Today's all about orientation, so first I'm going to talk you through the coffee processing that we do here at the factory. Coffee beans are like a stone inside a fruit, and in what's known as the wet process, the outer covering of skin and fruit is removed before the beans are dried. Wet processing involves the fruit being immersed in water in order to sort which fruit can and can't be used. Any bad fruit will float and can be thrown out at this point. This reduces levels of pollution from dirty waste that some other methods produce, though, admittedly, some people do say the wet process reduces flavor, too. After the fruit has been removed, we are left with the beans, which have to be dried to a water content of about 10% before they can be used to make coffee. We do this by machine. This is the way it's done where there are limits in terms of workspace, as is the case here. An alternative drying method is natural drying, which requires the beans to be spread out on special ground areas or tables in the sun. 
The air is better able to circulate around the beans in the natural method of drying, but it does increase the number of workers required. After the beans are dry, we go on to a process called polishing. This makes extra sure that the beans are completely clean. Some experts believe polishing damages the taste of the coffee, but that's a matter of opinion. And while polishing isn't actually required, we do it here to avoid the possibility of any remaining skin causing problems during roasting. Once the beans are fully clean, they're sorted by size and weight. This is also carried out by machine. The beans are blown through the air, and the ones that land in bins near the air source are the heaviest and best and will be made into the top quality brands, whereas the ones that fall further away are likely to produce a poorer flavor, though they will still be used for blending and making instant coffee and so on. Beans can also be sorted by color. This is the most difficult and time-consuming task, as it's done by hand and needs workers with expertise and experience. Once the sorting is completed, the beans are roasted and stored ready for distribution. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen carefully and answer questions 17 to 20. In a moment I'm going to take you on a tour of the building and we'll see where all of those processes take place. First, I'll take you through to reception where you'll sign in and out each day. This is important for fire regulations. That's located next to the visitor center where we hold tours for the public. Do pop in one afternoon when it's open. As well as seeing the working part of the factory, we have a treat for you, and that's the tasting room, where you'll get to try some of the products we make, and which we sell a selection of in our staff shop. These are available to staff at a discount. For one day only, you can choose something there for free, as our welcome to you. Ordinarily, we'd finish the tour with lunch in the staff canteen. It's being repainted at the moment, so we'll have some sandwiches here in the training room instead. I'm going to hand you out some protective clothing in a moment. Good to see you're all wearing sensible shoes, which we requested for the tour, so thank you for that. There are some caps in the basket near the door over there. Please collect one, even if you have very short hair. They're essential in all food production areas these days. We won't be handling anything today, though ordinarily you'll be wearing gloves to work with the beans. In a moment, I'm going to hand you out a badge with your name on. This is so we can get to know each other better. And hopefully, you've all remembered pen and paper, as I'll be giving you plenty of information to make a note of. That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now look at Section 3. Section 3. You will hear a student called Tim discussing his dissertation proposal with his tutor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Have you had any ideas about your dissertation proposal, Tim? I'm definitely doing something about saving dying languages, languages that are in danger of becoming extinct. Sounds like an interesting idea. How are you going to focus your project? Well, my grandmother's first language is spoken by only a handful of people now, so I'd like to record an interview with her that can be kept in an archive, which she was really keen to do when I asked her about it. I know there are linguists already working on recording dying languages, and when we focused on that in class, I realised I wanted to do something for my grandmother's heritage. I wanted to discuss with you how to go about it. You'd have to think carefully about what to include, of course. Something about the impact of technology, perhaps. You mean the fact that technology allows people to communicate at the click of a mouse across the world, so it contributes to languages becoming endangered? Mm -hmm. I know this has resulted in lots of languages disappearing because people use international languages like English to communicate instead of their own. That's why it's important to make an effort to conserve them. So, in your introduction, you could talk about the negative impact of globalisation on minority languages. Right, I'll mention that. And the media's had an enormous impact. Schools teach in the standard languages of a country rather than minority ones. That means young people lose the language skills of earlier generations because they aren't exposed to them as they would have been in the past. I'll definitely put that in. Good idea. I mean, take me for instance. I'm not a fluent speaker of my grandmother's first language, so most of the time we speak in English. Well, exactly. And then what are you going to say about how we can actually save dying languages? Well, I realise that there are organisations working to conserve them by creating libraries of audio and video material that document and conserve languages for future generations. That's what I'd like to contribute to. Though, I doubt whether it's possible to save my grandmother's language. There are so few people who speak it, I can't see why anyone would try to revive it. I don't think it's going to become anyone's first language again. Though, if I do this, at least there will be a record of it. And it may be that recording minority languages can save some of them from dying out. I don't get how, if no one's learning them as their first language. Well, the data that's collected isn't just stored away and forgotten about until someone rediscovers it in the future. It can be used to develop teaching materials within communities, so local children have learning tools they've never had access to before. You know, they can listen to and see these languages written down. Oh, right. I've also heard something about recording oral literature. What does that mean? Is it to do with how languages and culture are bound together? Exactly. Team members from the organisations we're talking about travel to remote communities and record their stories, rituals, songs. Ah, so it's not just language that's conserved. I see. It's like some of the traditions in my family that have come from my grandmother's community. It's important to me to keep those alive too. Hopefully I'll have my own grandchildren to pass them down to. And even if my grandmother's language itself doesn't survive, then at least some of the history and culture will. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen carefully and answer questions 27 to 30. So, talk me through your plan concerning interviewing and recording your grandmother. I want it to be useful. I'm not sure what I should be asking her to talk about that's going to get the best language samples. Well, let's discuss a few options. 
You don't really need to look at what linguists have already done in terms of translating your grandmother's language into English. As you speak the language, to a certain extent, it would be better for you not to use English. You want to collect samples of her speaking in her first language rather than asking her to translate things. So, once I've got some recordings, should I concentrate on looking at grammatical forms? Well, not necessarily. A better approach would be to focus on certain words, especially those for things which people don't use anymore, like in the home or on a farm. One way would be to get her to recount tales from her childhood. If you ask someone for a word, they might not remember it, but it might pop out in a sentence if they're focused on something that brings up the word naturally. Like, my grandmother might not remember a particular saying in her first language, but if I ask her to talk about her life, it might come up naturally in context. Exactly. Childhood's a good topic. Everyone has lots of memories they can talk about. And you'll get much more authentic samples if you get her talking rather than asking her to write things down or translate them. You will, of course, have to produce a written version eventually yourself, but that's quite different. OK. Now, what about the practicalities of doing the recording? I thought I'd do a few shorter meetings rather than one long one. I read something about that giving me some time to think about what we've spoken about, and then I'll have a chance to clarify stuff afterwards. Good, yes. Let the audio run and listen to it the same day. If you leave too long between recording and listening, there might be some things you don't remember properly. It's not necessary to make a written record of it straight away, though. Right. Do you think it might help to say when and where we did the interviews? Without doubt. But keep it small scale so it's easier to manage. Covering as much as you can seems like a good idea. It could lead to confusion, though. Yes, I get that. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now look at Section 4. Section 4. You will hear a lecture about the history of time measurement. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Hello. Today, I'm going to be talking about the history of the measurement of time, something we all take for granted now. These days, we're able to measure time extremely accurately, and there's global agreement on what the time is anywhere in the world. But of course, this has not always been the case. So, when and how did it all begin? Well, we can tell that prehistoric people from 30,000 years ago were aware of the changes of the moon as time went by. But 25,000 years passed before humans began to actually track time. There is credible evidence for this from around 5,000 years ago. And they did this by observing not just the movement of the sun, moon and stars, 
but by measuring where these were in relation to the Earth, and in particular, where these were in relation to the horizon. This was known as horizon tracking. For example, they noted the position on the horizon of the sun at sunrise and sunset, and how these positions changed throughout the year. From this, they were able to predict when the longest and the shortest days of the year were. Initially, this measurement was quite inaccurate and relied on suitable natural markers being on the horizon, such as hilltops, trees, etc. But measurement became more accurate and detailed when certain communities built markers specifically to view how the positions of the sun and moon related to them. One of the best remaining examples of these is Stonehenge in England, which consists of a number of very large stones arranged in a circle. OK, so let's have a look at the first clocks. It wasn't until around 1400 BC that the first primitive clocks were used to measure length of time. These were water clocks, and time was measured by filling a bucket with water which had a small hole in the bottom of it. As the water dripped out, the water level went down, marking the passage of time. Early civilizations also used the sun to measure time. Sundials were used to cast a shadow from the sun onto a horizontal surface marked with lines indicating the hours of the day. As the sun moved across the sky, the direction of the shadow moved across the dial, and the time could be read. Early time measurement in China and Japan also involved the burning of incense sticks. The longer the stick, the longer it burnt, and so standard lengths were used to measure lengths of time. Sometimes a stick with a different smell was burnt at a certain point in the day, and workers would know when to move on to the next task because of the change in incense. Let's now look at mechanical clocks. The first evidence of these is in the late 13th century in Northern Europe. They were made of iron, rather large and heavy, and the wheels of the clock were driven by a weight, which slowly descended. Initially, mechanical clocks didn't have a clock face and just struck a bell every hour. They were also only accurate to the nearest quarter of an hour. But it didn't matter if the time wasn't quite right, because there was only one clock in each community. However, when people travelled to other communities, they discovered the time there was different. This first became a real problem with the introduction of the railways in the 1840s. Up until then, sundials had been the most accurate way of telling the time. But these were dependent on shadows made by the sun, and this was too inaccurate for producing timetables. This meant that there was a need for a nationally agreed time system, and in 1847, the time at Greenwich in London was taken to be the point on which the national time was based. There was inevitably a lot of resistance to this in the middle decades of the 19th century. People in other places, like Bristol, for example, wanted their own time and didn't want to be dictated to by London. An even bigger problem came a few years later with the need for a globally recognised time system. International shipping at that time used maps on which Greenwich was the main reference point. As zero longitude passed through Greenwich, it was decided at a conference in Washington that all longitude would be calculated east and west from there. 
So then it made sense to use Greenwich to also measure time for the whole world, starting at the observatory at midnight. People could therefore be confident that when it was 8 a.m. in California, it was 5 p.m. in Paris every day. That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.